are the 1954 planes of your Navy. Jet fighters, heavy attack planes built to take off a carrier's deck and deliver a bomb load deep in enemy territory. Helicopters, patrol bombers, seaplanes, every type of aircraft needed to guard our nation and to strike back at any aggressor. But sleek and fast and modern as these planes are, the ingenuity and inventiveness of aircraft designers will make them obsolete in a short time, as obsolete as the planes of World War II, the planes of World War I, or planes like the one in which the Wrights made their historic flight in 1903. For well, the story of naval aviation parallels the story of aviation itself. It is progress through conflict, man against the air, man against the sea, man against the airplane, culminating in the conquest of the air, the sea, the airplane. Just seven years after the Wright's flight at Kitty Hawk, far-sighted Navy strategists assigned Captain Washington Irving Chambers the job of observing and reporting on aviation developments of particular concern to the Navy. In November 1910, Eugene Ely, a civilian pilot, successfully flew his Curtis-built plane off the deck of the cruiser Birmingham. In another demonstration a few months later, Ely used a crude arresting gear of cables and sandbags to land on the cruiser Pennsylvania. Doubters were convinced. An appropriation of $25,000 in 1911 procured for the Navy its first land plane and two seaplanes like this one. Three planes and one aviator, Lieutenant T.G. Ellison, trained by Glenn Curtis. The first aviation training camp was established at Annapolis in 1911. A very small group of officer students, including the first marine aviator, Lieutenant A.A. A. Cunningham, began to study the problems of flight. Catapult experiments from barges and later from ships were begun in 1912. Seaplane operations had developed to the point where seaplane units could take part in the Mexican intervention of 1914. At Veracruz, a plane piloted by a lieutenant Later, Admiral Bellinger was fired upon, the first Navy plane damaged in combat. World War I gave naval aviation a chance to show what it had learned during its short existence. Nearly 3,000 planes were built by Curtis, Martin, Boeing, and others. Thousands of pilots and observers were trained to utilize the Navy's new weapon. Haste was essential. German U-boats were threatening our supply lines and periling the Allied effort. The Naval Aviation Unit, commanded by Lieutenant Kenneth Whiting, was one of the first American groups to reach Europe. From coast bases in England, Italy, and France, flyers took off on U-boat patrols and raided German submarine pens on the North Sea. The Davis non-recoiling rifle was developed as an anti-submarine weapon. Naval aircraft designers had learned much from early wartime experiences. Their combined design talents produced the NC patrol planes, a joint effort of Curtis and Navy. These were completed too late to see action, however, but a greater future was planned for them. Under Commander John Towers, three of the NCs left New York in May 1919 to attempt a transatlantic flight to Portugal via Newfoundland and the Azores. Only the NC-4 made it all the way. The NC-4 skipper, Lieutenant Commander Albert Reed and his crew were given a dignified welcome in England and a noisy one in New York. Now came the 1920s, a period of rapid development in aircraft and flight operations. Established to conduct the expanding program of naval air, the Bureau of Aeronautics, under its first chief, Rear Admiral William Moffat, 
began to shape the destiny of aviation in naval planning. The main purpose, to send planes to sea on ships. First, gun turrets of capital ships were rigged to launch aircraft. The equipment was not always dependable. To take the risk out of such launchings, catapults were strengthened so that cruisers and battleships could carry their own aerial scouts. Successful takeoffs sent mines leaping ahead to the next logical step. Ships that could carry many planes, floating airfields to provide the concentration of force necessary for effective sea air attack. The time for the aircraft carrier was near. But exhaustive tests with arresting gear had first to be conducted on land to find some way of stopping a fast plane from crashing into parked aircraft. By 1922, arresting gear was available that could do the job, and it was installed on the Navy's first carrier, a decked over old collier christened the USS Langley. Lieutenant Godfrey Chevalier, one of naval aviation's pioneers, made the Navy's first carrier landing in an Aero Marine. There was still much to learn about deck operations. But nothing discouraged the determined aviators. They kept trying. This was a new problem demanding the utmost in skill and precision. These pioneers risked their lives to gain experience to test new ideas and perfect new techniques. Eventually, their courage and determination paid off. Carrier operations became routine a model of speed and efficiency. And the Navy had a new weapon to use with the big guns of the battle fleet. Meanwhile, designers were working with the first wind tunnel models create aircraft specially adapted to the Navy's needs. One of the first of these was the Martin Torpedo Bomber. Answering a long-standing hope of naval tacticians, tests showed that in the torpedo plane, the Navy had a potent weapon against the threat of other large navies. The performance of other Navy planes was being improved. Development of the radial air-cooled engine meant less weight per horsepower, and the resultant weight saving permitted heavier bomb loads and a longer range for the plane. One of these new plane types, the Hell Diver, became world famous for dive bombing accuracy. Marine and Navy interest in this precise form of bombing paid off in a big way when war came. Precision bombing of land and sea objectives was an art, one that had been perfected by years of practice and teamwork. Gunnery training on land and target practice in the air developed training techniques that gave the Navy a reputation for accurate shooting. Other schools trained crewmen in aircraft maintenance and engine repair. In the 20s, Navy Lieutenant Al Williams set many world speed records, demonstrating the rapid improvement that was being made in naval aircraft design. Navy 
competition in international speed classics like the Schneider Trophy Race for seaplanes, accelerated design improvements that ultimately benefited all aviation, civilian and military. The Washington Disarmament Conference of 1922 forced us to scrap plans for two half-built battle cruisers, but allowed them to be converted and completed as aircraft carriers. The Secretary of the Navy demonstrated how landings and takeoffs were to be made from the flight deck, much longer and wider than the Langley's. These two carriers were christened Saratoga and Lexington, beginning the tradition of naming aircraft carriers for great battles. Both participated in the war games of the late 20s. These exercises confirmed beliefs that carrier-based and operated aircraft would open a new era of sea air power. The Saratoga and the Lexington were joined by others in the 30s. The Ranger, Yorktown, Enterprise, Hornet, and Wasp. Forerunners of a mighty armada soon to come. After World War I, the Navy undertook the development of large, rigid airships as long-range scouts, the eyes of the fleet. A virtual monopoly of helium gave the U.S. a world advantage in airship development. Naval planners revealed great imagination and resourcefulness in adapting the airship to Navy needs. A Navy tanker, the Potoka, served as a seagoing base for the airships, permitting them to operate with the fleet for extended periods. An aircraft hook-on device allowed the airship to carry planes for its own defense or for attack. It was, in fact, an airborne aircraft carrier. But better performance of Navy planes made the airship scouting value questionable. When in the mid-30s, the tragic loss of the Akron and Macon demonstrated their vulnerability to bad weather. The Navy's rigid airship program was abandoned. However, Blimps, the non-rigid airship, did valuable work as convoy escorts a few years later in the Battle of the Atlantic. 